All right. So I'm going to assume that there are people watching, even though they're not here. Um, my name is Greg Barrett Wilt. I'm the director of the Mass Spec facility here in the Biotech Center. And this is part of the seminar series, Biotech Talks, um, in which we discuss technology and discuss sort of current state of the arts in the center. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is how we do lipidomics here at the UWBC Mass Spec facility. Specifically, what to expect when you're injecting a little wordplay there. Um, but the idea here is no biology. We're not going to talk about why you might want to do lipidomics. Uh, as researchers, I assume you know why you want to do lipidomics. We're going to talk about how to do lipidomics and how we are doing lipidomics. So like I say, no biology. It's meant to be very much a nuts and bolts kind of discussion. Um, the objectives here are what I have listed, uh, introduce the lipidomic service, uh, explain our couple of forms that we have to sort of organize our experiments, organize the samples, organize our thinking, uh, give some guidance on sample collection, um, storage and receipt, describe how we process the samples and do the extractions, describe the analytical platform, how we collect the data, talk about our current quantitative strategy, uh, discuss our analysis pipeline for the, uh, you know, the data analysis, and then show examples of some recent data and an example of the kind of report you can expect to get when you submit samples and then get information back. So the lipidomic service is a profiling of tissues uh, such as, well, any number of solid tissues, plasmas, serums, uh, cell pellets, and so forth. Um, some of the tissue types that we've worked on are liver, pancreas, intestine, skin, neuron, heart, hair, adipose tissue, eye, plasma, serum, HEK293 cells, and then we have some other sort of oddball matrices. Um, what we do with our lipidomic service is you drop off samples and tubes, the solid tissues, uh, fluids. We do the extraction. We do the lipid identification using uh, LCMSMS. We do the relative quantitation using LCMS, uh, one technical replicate injection per sample. Uh, we do some basic statistical analysis, and then we do the reporting. The preliminaries prior to sample submission are, there are two of them. The first is this initial discussion form. So the idea here is when you decide you want to do some lipidomics with us, uh, we have a meeting usually, and we'll have this initial discussion form where we want the experiment described briefly so we understand what the um, intentions are, who our sole contact person is, what the service is, in this case it's going to be lipidomics, uh, what are the sample matrices. So this is important because uh, each matrix that we analyze for lipidomic service needs to be treated very differently. So if you tell us you have 50 samples and then those 50 samples show up, but they're in five different matrices like uh, liver tissue and pancreas and heart and, and, and plasma, those actually are five different experiments. So that's why we need to have it explicitly enumerated here what the matrix is. Then how many, how many samples there are, what are the biological groupings that are relevant, uh, what kinds of uh, comparisons need to be made, um, if it's sort of one versus all or each versus the other, that's important to know. So this is step one. Um, step two is the actual sample submission form. So this is when you're bringing samples to us and it's time for us to actually work with the materials. So here, there's kind of a lot of text here. It's maybe a little bit small on the screen, but the bottom line is we've got the date, very important, uh, your name, email, and phone number so we can contact you if we have serious questions. Uh, who you work for, what your company is, if you're a company, uh, and then the UW funding string. So for external sources, that's often a direct invoice or a PO, but for internal clients, we need that UW funding string so that we know how to build the work after we're done. So this is a, a, a very sort of generic form we use for all of our mass spec submissions, but in this case, you want to check the lipidomic service. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, Sample IDs, biological groupings, that can also be on here. Uh, if it's easier, we can send you an Excel template so that you can fill out the individual sample IDs and their biological groupings, their genetic backgrounds, and what have you. Um, all that's possible. So 
When it's time to receive samples, uh, these are some of the guidelines. Um, tissues, these are solid tissues, should be snap frozen in liquid nitrogen after dissection, and each sample should be greater than 50 milligrams in size because that is the mass of tissue that we're putting into our extraction. So we need more than that from which to sample. If it's serum or plasma, they should be immediately stored at minus 80, and the volume must be greater than 40 microliters because we're going to consume 40 microliters for our extraction. Um, for smaller samples or, for example, dif difficult tissues, uh, we've done some work in neuron, and those are very challenging to manipulate. Um, we can give you our 2 mil homogenization tubes uh, so that you can sample into those directly. So there's no losses associated with transferring perhaps a small mass or a sticky tissue from one vial to the other. You can just sample directly into the homogenization vials and then uh, record the weight. So you will have pre-weighted, added tissue, weighted again. Now we know what the mass is. And then you bring those back to us. So we can't really make any prop promises about the data quality if you have very small tissue sizes, um, if you have very small volumes, or if you have very small amounts of mass. But uh, we will do our best. Um, and you know, that's not saying we won't look at you if you have less than 15 milligrams of tissue. But I just want to make it clear that there's a reason for that. We need to have some tissue here from which to do reproducible extractions. Um, samples have to be delivered to us. If it's your sample and we're doing the work, bring it to us and we will stick it in our freezer. We have a whole sample receipt SOP. We have uh, locations in our minus 80 uh, cataloged and, and uh, recorded. So there's no exceptions to that. If we're doing the work, bring us the samples. And Tim Shriver is our uh, expert at extractions. He's the one that organizes our freezer and keeps records of all of the locations of things. He's the person to talk to. Uh, here's his email address. It's very great, very nice guy and uh, he'll help you out. So now that we have your samples and they're in our lab and we go and grab them out of our minus 80, uh, what happens next? So if it's a tissue, we'll do the weighing uh, into our homogenization tubes. These are the Kaijin power bead tubes. They're, they, they contain a 1.4, there well, 1.4 millimeter ceramic ball. Um, well, actually, they contain many of those. Uh, we, uh, Tim does the weighing out on dry ice, so everything stays frozen. Uh, if it's a plasma or a serum, here we go, um, 40 microliters gets placed in a 1.5 mil centrifuge tube for the homogenization. We don't necessarily use these uh, power bead tubes. Uh, we add 250 microliters of PBS and 225 microliters of methanol. That methanol contains our internal standard mix, which is a Avanti uh, splash lipid mix. Um, which is our internal standard, homogenized for 30, uh, 30 seconds at 30 hertz in pre-chilled uh, adapter blocks that hold these 1.5 or 2 mil tubes. We can hold up to 48 samples at a time, um, so that's uh, pretty decent throughput. Um, it goes, the homogenization goes through four rounds with a five minute rest uh, at four degrees C between each to keep things cool. And then, after homogenization, we add 750 microliters of methyl tert butyl ether, and it goes through another two rounds of extraction. Um, that, again, is at 30 hertz, this time 40 seconds with a five-minute rest in between. After that, it goes into the, uh, well, ice, and rests for 15 minutes. And then it gets a uh, hard spin at 17,000 G in the cold room for five minutes uh, to separate the phases, pellet the homogenized and, uh, tissue debris, and uh, from that we then pull off 700 microliters of the upper methyl tert-butyl ether phase, which contains our lipids. That then goes into another tube and is dried in a speed vac. Um, the dried extract is reconstituted in 150 microliters of isopropyl alcohol with vortexing. That then gets another hard spin for the purpose of pelleting any fine particulates that have made it into uh, the MTBE layer which can then foul our HPLC. And you, know, you can ask me how I've learned that. Uh, but but that, was a, that was something that we discovered pretty quickly. Um, concurrently, with all of the samples, we also extract a process blank, which is just solvents, and a process blank plus our internal standard mix, which is a control for the uh, performance or the, the uh, analytical uh, 
uh, behavior of these internal standards through the extraction process. So now we've got extracts. Time to collect the data. So the platform we're using is an Agilent platform. Um, it's a UHPLC, so this is a 1290 Infinity 2 HPLC system. Uh, it's capable of 1300 bar, which is over 18,000 PSI. So it has some pretty robust power, uh, I should say pressure uh, parameters. That allows us to use uh, chromatographic columns with small particle size that increases our capacity, increases our chromatographic resolution. It also allows us to use higher flow rates and more viscous solvents. All of these things are highly relevant to the lipidomics analysis, uh, which I will explain to you in just a moment. The mass spectrometer we're using, coupled to this HPLC system, is an Agilent 6546 QTOF instrument. It's very new, I think it was released maybe two years ago. And uh, the schematic of the instrument is here. Um, so what we've got, and I'll just sort of scooch around the front here. What we've got here is a uh, electrospray nebulizing source. Uh, ions generated here move through the capillary into the vacuum system where they get desolvated. Uh, they are then uh, transmitted into the first quadrupole at the mass filtering device. Uh, they move through that device uh, through a collision cell and then get focused and accelerated into the time of flight region. This flight path is probably in excess of three meters. So that is what gives us our very high resolving power. But that is the way the instrument works in a full spectrum survey type mode. This instrument will also do MSMS -MS mode. So not MS1, but two stages of mass spectrometry where collision occurs and fragment ions are produced. So in that experiment, uh, Ions come in here just as before, but the quadrupole now does a mass filtering. So we've isolated only a one Dalton wide slice of the mass spectrum. Those ions then move into the collision cell where a DC offset is applied, which uh, um, adds energy to the molecules, induces fragmentation of the um, covalent bonds, the most labile bonds break first. And then those fragment ions are subjected to the same kind of uh, time of flight uh, uh, analysis as the survey spectra, and we can get accurate mass and good resolution on the fragment ions. So we can see not only what their M over Z values are of every ion in the co species, but also get structural information on specific ions that we've selected in the quadrupole. So the features of this mass spec are that it's got a mass range of 50 to 10,000. We don't analyze up to 10,000 in our lipidomics experiments. We go up to about 1,500. It acquires very fast uh, data. So the transients are at 10 gigahertz. Uh, we typically collect three spectra per second, which you can do the math. That's about 3,000 uh, 3, transients per spectrum. The resolving power tends to be in the 40 to 60 kiloton, or sorry, 40 to 60,000 range, and with internal calibration, we're getting mass accuracies of around 0.8 parts per million. This is a uh, photograph of our lab. Uh, here is the mass spec part. Here's the flight tube, and once again, I'd say that you know the flight path going up to here and coming back down is about three meters, so that is a critical uh, figure of merit for this instrument. Here is the UHPLC system, so. Outlet of the column goes into the inlet of the mass spec. And then over here, we've got a nitrogen generator which drives gas delivery to the entire system. And that is a nice and robust process so that we never have any downtime. So more on data collection. UPLC conditions, or should say UHPLC conditions. The column we're using is a Waters uh, BEH C18. This is a particularly uh, robust chromatographic stationary phase. Um, it has a 1.7 micron particle size. Those are the small particles which require the high pressure capabilities of the LC. The dimensions are 2.1 by 100 uh, millimeters. So it's analytical scale, um, or maybe they call it narrow bore chromatographic format. And we run this at 50 degrees C. We have to do that because our solvents are a is 60% acetonitrile, water, ammonium formate, and formic acid, but B is 90% uh, isopropyl alcohol, highly viscous solvent, and that kind of viscos viscosity yields a high back pressure when we're flowing at half a millimeter. 
and that back pressure gets up to about 14,000 psi. Actually, it's 14,500 psi. Um, but we have to run it at 50 degrees in order to try to reduce the viscosity of the solvent when we're using these small particles and this highly viscous uh, uh, solvent system. This is the shape of the gradient down here. So we start at 15% B, which is, of course, 15% of 60% acetonitrile. Sorry, 15% of 90% 2, uh, 2 propanol in 60% acetonitrile. So that keeps all the lipids well solubilized. And then we ramp rapidly, and lipids are basically eluding over this entire chromatographic uh, gradient. And then back to reequilibration here. Now, the data collection takes place in two stages. First, there is an MSMS stage um, for lipid identification. So, and I'll talk about this probably more than you want to hear in a minute. But uh, suffice to say, there's two steps in acquisition of data for a project. The MSMS stage, which allows us to get identifications on the lipids present in your sample, and then an MS stage for the quantitation of lipids in each sample. Um, and that's done for both positive and negative ion modes. So these positive ion mode and negative ion mode are really treated quite separately. And I'll get to that in a little bit about why that's the case. So some of the features of acquisition in this LC-MS-MS mode are that the sample that gets analyzed by LC-MS-MS uh, consists of aliquots pooled from all samples or biological groups in your sample set. So the reason for that is that this ensures that any lipid present in any one of your samples is going to be present in this pool and therefore accessible for identification. Um, MSMS is done with iterative replicate injections. That's a, a setting in the software that allows us to go through and uh, identify uh, or take MSMS spectra on a list of precursors and then exclude those precursors in subsequent injections. Um, yeah, and that's what I say here. Precursors are selected in a data-dependent manner with the highest abundance lipids first and then lower abundance lipids analyzed in subsequent injections. We typically perform five iterative runs and we set the dilution level such that we are overloading the instrument, both not so much chromatographically, but more on the mass spec side, which allows us to get uh, more abundant signal for low abundance lipids. So uh, things that would be normally below selection param uh, parameters for MSMS now come up above that threshold and get chosen for identification experiments. So the iterative, oh, that's very dark. The iterative experiment that I was describing, um, this is an analysis of a reference material we use. It's the NIST SRM 1950. It's called Metabolites in Plasma. Some of those metabolites are lipids. You can buy this from NIST, and we've been using it for quite some time now as a control reference material that we can do experiments with and make improvements with. So these five iterative injections now that we've done, um, you can see the reproducibility of the chromatographic system and of the uh, mass spec in the, 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 the level of the signal that we're seeing across these different replicate injections. Um, but this is what the data looks like when you zoom in on it. So what you're, what you're seeing here is these uh, high abundance signals here. Those are the MS1 survey spectra. So that's a total ion chromatogram. It shows, all, uh, it shows uh, the summed abundance of all ions present at that moment in time in each of these spectra eluding into the instrument. Uh, the dropouts or the gaps between these peaks constitute times when precursor ions have been selected in the first quadrupole, fragmented, and then the fragments detected. So we're throwing away huge amounts of ions in order to isolate one lipid, fragment it, and then collect the MSMS spectrum. So down here, this is, this is uh, replicate one or in iteration one. This is iteration two. And you can see here the, the gaps are a little bit bigger. Uh, there are reasons for that in terms of automatic uh, signal accumulation and so forth. Um, but the MSMS events happen down here, and the MS1 events have abundances up here. So with these iterative uh, sets of data collection, um, we've gone through and, and looked at you know, what do we get in terms of our uh, yield on lipid identifications after multiple rounds of this iterative experiment. 
So this again is the SRM 1950 reference material. Um, and we got positive mode and negative mode data here. So how many lipids do we identify and how many uh, mass spectral features are present in each of these runs as we accumulate more and more data over more and more iterations? And here are the answers. So with the iteration one in positive mode, we get about 240 or so IDs. Iteration two, we come up to about 300. Iteration three, four, five, we sort of flatten out. So we've really reached the limit of what we can detect in the experiment, telling us there's no point in doing six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've got all, gotten all the data we can get out of five. Similarly, in negative ion mode, we get about, what's that, 280 or so in the first injection, and then in subsequent injections, that number increases, and then it very much levels off. So we don't gain anything by doing numerous additional iterative experiments. We've reached the limit of what we can detect with this dilution level on this platform in this way. So moving to the LCMS now type of data acquisition away from the identification and towards the quantitation experiment. Uh, whereas the MSMS experiment was done with uh, pooled samples, the MS1 experiment is done with each sample injected individually. Uh, because once again, we're not trying to identify lipids, we've identified them. Now we want to go back and quantitate their values in each sample. So the dilution level is chosen such that we can eliminate or at least minimize detector saturation. Whereas in the MS, MS experiment, we wanted to boost the signal for all these low abundance lipids and suffer some saturation at the high end. Um, that's not used for quantitation, so it doesn't matter so much. In the, MS, in the MS1 experiment, that matters a lot. So we change the dilution level. And what I'm showing down here, this is supposed to be purple and blue. The purple one's the tall one, the blue one's the lower one. Um, the 30x dilution in this particular tissue was what we chose for the MSMS experiment. But that was too concentrated for MS1. So then we use a 50x dilution for the MS1 data. And I think you can see it better over here. So this is the total line chromatogram versus a base peak chromatogram. The base peak chromatogram shows, broadly speaking, the abundance of uh, a single individual lipid highly abundant, eluding over time. So here you can see the purple ones saturate sort of here and here and here, whereas the more diluted uh, 50x dilution, the blue traces, there's a saturation here, but not here and not there and not there. So there's a value in having this different dilution factor. Uh, and again, I'd say, um, you know, our, our, our paradigm is a single replicate injection per sample in each ionization mode. And of course, what that should be highlighting is the value comes in biological replicates, not as much in technical replicates. So we have a design for our work lists. The, these are the, the, the lists of, of sample acquisitions. Uh, and we've sort of <laughs> put, in a lot of, put a lot of thought into that design. We've settled upon this format here. So we start in positive ion mode, and the reason for that is because we tend to dilute positive ion samples more than negative ion samples. A more dilute sample will have less risk of carryover into subsequent samples. So we run the more diluted samples first, and then move to negative mode where the samples tend to be at higher concentration. So the way we set this up is uh, we start with a set of blanks that are just sort of to equilibrate, clean, and uh, stabilize the chromatographic system. Then we run this splash mix. Once again, I'll get to that in a moment, but this is the internal standard mixture that we're using. Um, we do that three times so we can collect a little bit of statistics and a little bit of reproducibility data. Then we run a blank, and then we analyze our SRM 1950. So this is the standard reference material that we're analyzing in every batch of samples. So we've got now some historical data on the performance of this material over time. That gets analyzed, as I said, by MS1 uh, and also by five iterations of MSMS. Then we run some blanks, and then we move on to the collection of the MSMS data on the pooled sample. Now, I've, I've set two different uh, dilution factors. This, this you know, letter X means dilution factor A and dilution factor B. As I mentioned before, we use sometimes different dilution factors for MS1 and MSMS. So the A represents the dilution factor we've chosen for MS1. B represents the dilution factor we've chosen for MSMS. So we collect this data on the pooled sample. Then we collect the iterative data for lipid identification. 
do some blanks, and now we move on to our samples. So we'll collect all of our sampled values, or all of our sample data, at the same dilution factor. So the reason we set it up this way is that we now can compare that same dilution in the pooled sample to that dilution in each of the biological samples. And we run like two samples in a blank, two samples in a blank, et cetera. This is the start of the queue, the middle of the queue, and I've just sort of arbitrarily chosen a 24 sample set for this. The middle of the queue will have another one of these pooled samples. So now we can compare the values for each of these lipids that we collected initially and in the middle and at the end. So now we can describe some statistics on how the uh, behavior of this pooled sample should be not changing, but we can verify that it's not changing over time and convince ourselves that if we see trends in the data over the course of the queue, and I should point out that these are injected sort of in a random order, but if we do have somehow see trends, we can use the uh, injection of these pooled samples to show that those trends are not a function of the platform, they're a function of the samples themselves. So at the end of the positive ion queue, we run the process blank, we run the splash uh, um, added process blank, and then we switch over to negative mode, so these should be red here. Um, so now we have, we're, we're in negative mode, we run some blanks, we once again inject the splash mix, we use a larger injection volume because the sensitivity of the instrument for lupins in negative mode is slightly less than it is in positive mode. And then we do the same thing again. We run the SRM 1950. Uh, in this case, in negative mode, it's a 1x dilution. Collect the MSMS for lipid identification from the 1950 and move on. Uh, start of the queue looks the same. We, use the, we collect the pooled sample. We collect the MSMS on the pooled sample. And this, I'm show, I'm, I've chosen C and D now as the two different types of dilution factors that we're using. And then we go on and collect our individual data, sample one at, at, at dilution factor C, sample two, et cetera. In the middle, we do the same thing. Pooled sample in the middle, compare that to the beginning. Pooled sample at the end, compare that to the middle and the beginning and make sure that we're not seeing any changes in our lipid readout over the course of the queue. And then at the end, once again, we'll do the process blank and the process blank with a splash added to it. So the quantitation strategy. Um, the analytical paradigm we're using at the moment is all about relative quantitation. We are not trying to put on uh, nanomoles per mil or picograms per mil. Um, the paradigm that we've used, that we've selected, is for relative quantitation between two sample groups, three sample groups, four sample groups, whatever you've got. Um, but that's where the, I think the strength of the readout is. Now, as I say here, the data outputs are in peak areas, not in concentrations. Now, it is true that our internal standard mix does have concentration values on it, but it's also a very limited mixture of uh, lipids. There's only 14. And so they, they in no way cover uh, a broad diversity of classes. In fact, there is one constituent for each lipid class, not more than one. And I think that, well, it's not just me, it's also in like the best practices literature, um, that to quantify individual lipids, you need more than one of those standards per lipid class. Um, so that's the reason, that's really the central reason why we're only describing relative quantitation at the moment. Now these are strategies we may want to move to in the future, but they are not part of our service at the moment. So. One of those is like bulk lipid class quantitation. Um, from my reading, what I've seen is that hillock chromatography, hydrophilic interaction chromatography is the way to go to do these kinds of bulk lipid class quantitations because different uh, lipid subclasses will tend to be loot simultaneously. So you, all your phosphatidylcholines will be here and all your lysophosphatidylcholines will be out there and they'll come out in a hump and you can quantitate the entire hump. Whereas with the reverse phase, you get individual elutions based significantly on the chain length of your acyl chains. We also might employ or move to or attempt targeted LC-MS-MS strategies where we're looking at very specific lipids, specific retention times with internal standards and calibration curves and the whole nine yards. Um, also, our lipid uh, internal standard mix does not contain any free fatty acids. So that's a sort of glaring omission from the ability to quantify uh, specifically the fatty acid lipids. 
Um, and then we might also consider using varying internal standard spike levels, such that we could generate calibration curves in matrix and have a much better understanding about the matrix effects for specific lipids uh, in your biological samples. So, and this is sort of a, <laughs> maybe I'm overemphasizing this, but we really want the experimental objectives be, uh, to be established prior to sample submission. We want to know what we're doing and what the expectations are. Um, and I think that's going to, that kind of communication just makes everybody more comfortable. So now we've got a bunch of data. Uh, what, what's next? Uh, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions or comments from anybody. Well, Greg, we just, we just have one, qu one question about the mass, the mass range. Sorry, I was getting some feedback there. Just the mass range. If you could go over the mass range, M over Z values again. Sure. So, yeah, that's actually a good point to clarify. So the instrument can collect, uh, it's got three modes of operation. One is what they call a low mass mode, which is 50 M over Z to 1700 M over Z. Then there's a normal mass mode, which is 50 M over Z to 3200 M over Z. And then there's a high mass mode. And I don't know what the low end of the high mass mode is. I frankly have spent very little time with it. But the top end of that mass range is 10,000. So that is, so th these are, like I said, the figures of merit of this instrument. It goes up to 10,000. But our uh, experiments hang out in the low mass end. Now, we collect our MS1 data between um, M over Z 119 and 1500 in positive ion mode. And in negative ion mode, we start at M over Z 100 and go to 1500. And there's a good reason for that. There's an interference ion at, at M over Z 118. That's MS1. In MS MS mode, that low end drops down to, I believe, 50. So it's 50 up to 1500 um, for MS MS. And the reason, of course, for that is because once you've done the isolation in the quadrupole, you've already thrown away a whole pile of chemical noise. So we can go down lower, where in an MS1 event, you might have a bunch of interfering ions. But, but in our MS MS events, those ions are all gone. So hopefully that was clarification enough. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to what we do once we've got our data. So the data analysis workflow looks like this. As I've said probably too many times now, lipid identification comes from the MS MS data. Uh, that then yields a database of lipids identified from these samples in positive ion and negative ion modes. Um, we then use that database, database to integrate the peak areas from each individual sample in the MS data. We then, I then go through and look at all those peak integrations and make sure that they are um, accurate and not spurious. Um, that data then is exported as lists of lipids lists of samples and peak areas in each of those cells. And after that, that's, you know, that, that data then comes to you as, a, as the client. But beyond that, we'll do things like reformat the output for use in other downstream data analysis software. We'll group samples, so we'll, we'll add a column or a, a row that says, you know, these are in group A, these are in group B, these are in group C. Um, we can apply normalization. We can apply transformation and scaling of the data. And then we move on to what I call the fun stuff, which is the, you know, the, the, the figures that everyone, that I at least want to see, which is like, what does the ANOVA look like? What are the significant features? What do the volcano plots look like for two comparisons? And what do the heat maps look like? That's the stuff that sort of like is the payoff after all of this work. So the lipid identification portion comes from software called Lipid Annotator. Um, and this is built. Um, also using other software, Lipid Blast and MS Dial. Um, but this is the Agilent product that we're using at the moment, where uh, experimental MS MS data is compared against an in silico spectrum for each type of lipid, or each specific lipid, and scored. So uh, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but suffice it to say that um, the software has some interesting uh, capabilities. One is, you know, this, which is essentially the lipid readout. I, we've identified this lipid, and here's the evidence for it. Another, which I don't have an example of here, 
uh, but you know, they're scattered all throughout, is that it can determine the composition of a mixed MSMS -MS spectrum. So lipids are obviously highly isomeric. And you can get lipids with very similar, the identical M over Z values and very similar fragmentation. But they can still be mixtures of multiple lipids. And the software can go through and assign a percent or an estimated percent contribution to the total MSMS -MS spectrum of each of those lipids. And in some cases, you know, this list of these contributors can be 10 or 20 lipids long. In other cases, obviously in this case, there's only one lipid that has yielded the best match or a good match to the in silico spectrum from the experimental spectrum. So that's the first aspect of this lipid annotator software. One of the other outputs of this software are what I call these uh, scatter plots or XY plots and these pie charts. So here we're looking at positive ion data and let's see how many lipids do we got? We got 355 lipids in this case. This is like a still a plasma sample. Um, in this view of the data or display of the data, we've got uh, M over Z value on the Y axis. We've got retention time on the X axis. So you're really getting a, a picture of the elution performance or elution properties of this sample and the lipids that I get identified at each moment in time at each M over Z value. And then, um, so this, for me, this is very informative because I like to see this being very dense. I can see if there are gaps. I can see if there are like a weird population of things stick, sitting in a place where I don't expect them. And then, of course, the pie chart readout, we don't have a lot of control over how this looks, but you can see the numbers of lipids of each of these classes that have been identified. So here we have triacylglycerols occupying a lot, and then the phosphatidylcholines occupying a significant slice as well. And so here we have other ones, lysophosphatidylcholines, diacylglycerols, sphingomyelins, and you know, you can see there are numerous ones. This is all positive ion data. This is negative ion data. So here we see different populations um, of lipids being identified at different M over Z values, and then of course a dramatically different uh, distribution of lipid classes that have been identified from the data. Still phosphatidylcholines, but now we got phosphatidylethanolamines, and well, you, know, you can see there's there's a pretty decent diversity of lipids that have been identified in negative mode differing from the ones identified in positive mode. So this is all the identification work that gets done. After this is done, uh, you export the database of lipids that have been identified in your samples. That database consists of a name, an M over Z value and a retention time. That then gets used by this software, which is called ProFinder, also an Agilent product. In ProFinder, you now take that database, which has a name, lipid name, an M over Z value, and a retention time, and you extract ion chromatograms of those lipids from every sample and compare or uh, discover what the abundances are in each of those samples. So um, this again is some more plasma data, uh, plasma data. So over here, we've got the list of identified lipid species from this sample. Um, here we've got the integrations of each individual lipid in individual samples. So this is basically the integration of all these phosphatidylcholines. And this, this, th this display, I think 14, I think there are actually like 16 or 17 samples in the list. Um, so this is how the individual lipid peak areas show up in each sample. Here are the extracted ion spectra, or the extracted lipid spectra, I should say, from these chromatographic peaks. Um, so you can see, once again, if there are weird outliers, or it's like, hey, suddenly all of these lipids or all of these samples are showing uh, M plus uh, sodium. Now this one here is only M plus ammonium. Well, what's going on with that one? Down here, we see the sort of readout of the actual individual data um, in tabular form, so that's uh, um, these are uh, peak areas here, and then we've got uh, what else? Um, retention time differences. Yeah, sorry. This one here is the um, the mass accuracy, and then this is the variation in retention time. And I should point out that prior to this processing, where we actually do these uh, peak area extractions or integrations, we also do a retention time alignment, so everything is lined up well. That's a piece, piece uh, part of the software. Now here's an example of why I need to go through and look at these by hand. 
for each lipid. This is just a, uh, the, the integration product of the software running through its algorithm. But you can see it's chosen different chromatographic peaks for the uh, different isomers of the same lipid and assigned them <laughs> slightly randomly. So if we hypothesize that the one at 14 minutes is the actual correct retention time for this lipid, um, I would then go through and make sure that we're integrating not this uh, neighboring isomer at 13 point whatever, but actually the correct lipid species in each sample. And you know, <laughs> the, the, the fact that this occurs is the reason that it needs to be uh, examined by hand. So after all of that work is done, we then go through and uh, export that list of peak areas, which I mentioned. It's a CSV file, so easily manipulable, easily uh, importable into numerous different types of software packages. And we can also uh, do some blank subtraction and do the statistics calculations here on how uh, consistent and reproducible the uh, lipid um, values or lipid uh, uh, quantitations are from the replicate injections of that pooled sample. So we can gain some confidence in our ability to uh, accurately uh, measure these abundances across the samples from start to end. Um, and in this case, I'm showing there's a, this is an internal standard, so that should be there, but this is actually a uh, carryover. It's a, it's a uh, what would you call it, a contaminant ion um, that's present in the blank, it's present in the splash mix, and but the, the fact that we observe this means that we can now subtract that out of all the data because it's not in the samples, it's in the platform. I should point out that that's very unusual. Our lipid, our, our, our blanks are usually very blank. So now I've made a mention a bunch of times to this splash lipid mix. Uh, so let's talk about what it actually is. So it contains these 14 different um, lipid species. All of them have been labeled with deuterium. So that moves them away uh, from the endogenous lipid on the M over Z axis. But they have all the same properties of the endogenous lipid species. So um, these are phosphatidylcholine, ethanolamine, serine, phosphatidylglycerol, inositol, phosphatidic acid, lysophosphatidylcholine, lysophosphatidylethanolamine, cholesterol ester, monoacylglycerol, diacylglycerol, triacylglycerol, cholesterol, and sphingomyelin. So when I talk about, like I said, these ones are all at known concentration. When I talk about the, um, the questions I have about the suitability of these concentration values applying as a blanket to all of the lipid species, um, you know, these are all, well, this whole batch here is phosphatidyl, uh, uh, fatty acids, right? Uh, phospho, phospholipids. We've got a cholesterol ether and a cholesterol, um, and then we've got these uh, um, acyl glycerols, but there are bunches of lipids that we're not seeing, and there's, you know, there's eight big classes of lipids. I don't know the names of all of them. Sterols is one, but sterols can be difficult to analyze by, by mass spec, and polyketides. Um, but in my opinion, and uh, again, literature agrees, um, this is an insufficient list to provide accurate quantitation on this body of uh, phospholipids. So what does that splash mix look like? So this is a little bit QC now. Um, this is the, oh, that's very, very faint. This is the uh, uh, positive ion analysis. We do this at a 15x dilution. Um, and what you see are these are lysophosphatidylcholine and ethanolamine. Monoacylglycerol is related to the blip. Um, but we see cholesterol, uh, phosphatidylglycerol, sphingomyelin, choline, uh, inositol, serine, uh, ethanolamine, diacylglycerol, triacylglycerol, and cholesterol ester. Now these are at, yes, they have different instrument responses. That's why they have big differences in signal. But they also have big differences in their concentrations in that splash, splash mix. And that also is driving the very large dynamic range of signal heights here, uh, is the fact that they're not all at a uniform concentration. That's positive mode. This is negative mode. Um, once again, we see these lyso uh, PC and PE. Um, 
Phosphatidylglycerol comes up pretty significantly relative to the others. Sphingomyelin is nice and robust. Inositol is nice and robust. And then PC still is a highly abundant lipid, a high concentration in this mixture. And it shows up in negative mode as well. So we can track the performance of this lipid, uh, of this splash mix over time. And that's what this data is showing. We've got data from September through February. And uh, this is now all in this program called Skyline. And uh, each of these colored bars represents a different lipid species. This is all the positive ion data I showed you a minute ago. And you know the takeaway here is that the retention time stability of these lipids across these five or six months or whatever is really quite excellent. We put a lot of work into developing standard operating procedures for making up our splash mixes, making up our solvents, managing the column, and the payoff then is this kind of stability. And we can look at that for individual lipid species. So I've got a couple of positive mode ion uh, uh, lipids and a couple of negative mode lipids I'm going to show. Here is that uh, phosphatidylcholine retention time stability. It's basically the same as this data here, um, but now just for this one lipid. And then you can see its abundance over time as well. So these sort of uh, step functions here uh, represent times when we've uh, performed a system tune, so changing the detector response, or performed some significant cleaning, so changing the sensitivity. Um, phosphatidylcholine, triacylglycerol, so once again, retention time stability, abundance stability, uh, cholesterol, retention time stability, abundance stability, and then in negative mode, phosphatidylglycerol, retention time and abundance, looking very uh, consistent, and uh, inositol, and what else, sphingomyelin. So, so these are sort of metrics we can collect sort of in a longitudinal way and gain confidence in the reprodu reproducibility of the data. And now moving on from the splash mix to the NIST SRM 1950, we also have been collecting this data over many months now. So we can look at trends and performance over time. So here we've got uh, positive ion numbers of lipids identified from this standard mixture starting back in July now and going to middle of December. So it's bouncing around, uh, call it 350-ish. And in negative mode, we, there was one instance where we didn't actually collect the negative mode data. Uh, we didn't need it. So uh, those, those numbers are also bouncing around 300 to 350 over time. So we have some confidence in our platform stability uh, for this reference material, which is unchanging. Um, we also can detect features. Uh, so this is spectral features across the entire chromatogram, across the entire data set for this SRM 1950. And in positive mode, we're hovering around 3,500 features detected from one of these iterative MSMS experiments. And in negative mode, that number is bouncing around 2,500. Last, we can look at the raw signal level for this reference material once again over time. And in positive mode, we're looking at about 4e to the 8 is where we should be. And in negative mode, we should be around 1e to the 8. Um, and so then we know if we're not seeing that, something is wrong. So this is the reason to collect this data. So now the last bits are going to be some examples of recent data. Um, and this is uh, uh, lipids and plasma. We did this work in December. Um, and the software we're using, so we take the outputs now of ProFinder, right, these lists of lipid IDs across samples and their integrated abundances, and we um, put that data into, uh, at least I've been doing this, putting this data into uh, MetaboAnalyst. This is out of McGill University in Canada, and it's a fantastic software package, and it's all on the web. Um, so you start here, click here to start. Okay, we start. And what I use from this really at the moment is only the statistical analysis package. When we put our data into that statistical analysis package, we've got groupings, we've done normalization, we've done transformation, we've done scaling of the data. Um, we can then do, in this case, it's, a, it's a, a three group experiment. So this is an ANOVA. And what we see, uh, I guess this did come out, that's good. What we see are down here in, well, it's sort of like a gold color, I think, or brown. These are the non-significant lipids. And I think there's like 310 or thereabouts in this set data set, positive ion mode. And all of these lipids are showing significance 
in their abundances, significance in the difference in their abundances across these different groupings. And highlighting, I mean, this is kind of fantastic data. This is a p-value of 10. It's log, log, negative log 10 p-value of 10 is just off the charts. Um, so we're looking at a cholesterol ester, and here's you know, group one, here's group two, group three, phosphatidylcholine, group one, group two, group three. This data is just, you know, it's all you could wish for as ter in terms of significance. Um, similarly, in negative mode, here are the non-significant values. Up here are all the significant lipids, and they also show similar changes. Group one down here, groups two and three way up here. One, two, three, one, two, three. But, you know, with significance, and that's kind of the payoff, right? That's what you really want. Um, this software can also generate these nice heat maps. So this is kind of the same thing. We've got the three different groups up on top with the different colored bars, and then they've been allowed to cluster. I actually didn't force them to stay together. Of course, they just clustered together, which is nice. Um, and we've got uh, lipids that, that are going down relative to the other ones, and lipids that are going up relative to the other ones, and so you blow those up, and you can start to see like these are the individual players. These are the ones that are changing, increasing in these uh, groups relative to that group. And then down here, opposite is the case, it lipids that are increasing and lipids that are decreasing. Lastly, uh, this is an example of the kind of report you can expect to get when you submit samples. So I know it's completely unreadable, but what I want to highlight here is just uh, what information will you get. So there's a summary. There's uh, sections on the methods. Here's the chromatographic gradient. These are all the instrument parameters. Um, and there's some description of the data analysis. Then there are results. So these are the inputs here. In this case, it's, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember if this is tissues or plasma, but these are the biological groupings and then the individual identifiers. Uh, performance. Um, in uh, lipid annotator, so this is the uh, total ion chromatograms from the MSMS data, the scatter plots, the, uh, the pie charts, positive mode, negative mode, how many lipids got identified in total, performance of the SRM 1950 standard mixture, and then uh, these are the uh, abbreviations used. So they can <laughs> you, your output will have just abbreviated lipid names, but you know, what, what do they mean? This is the translation table. And then, as an appendix, uh, I sort of um, will, like I said, perform this rudimentary statistical analysis and metaboanalyst and highlight some data that might be interesting or data that I think is kind of standout. So that's what I've done here. I've, I've looked at the largest, uh, the, the, the lipids that have the highest significance in their relative abundances and just pulled out those uh, box and whisker plots for each one of these. Um, but that is, uh, that's our service. That's like what we do, how we do it, what you can expect to get out. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, obviously Greg and Tim and the Mass Spec Facility, phenomenal people. Um, UWC administrative uh, uh, individuals giving us lots of support. The Simcox Lab for helping us set up all these methods. Uh, the Aikida Lab. Uh, uh, Mike Landowski, that's his data that I've been showing when I'm very appreciative to him that he let me show it. At Agilent, Shaher is their uh, lipid uh, expert. John Osborne, uh, Mark Hoppe, and Sandy Yates. And then the UW Medicine Comprehensive Diabetes Center. Um, and this is the south side of the Biotech Center, and these are where you're going to find us. Second floor, these rooms right there, that's uh, the Mass Spec Lab. So stop by and say hello. Um, I guess the parting words, if there are, if, if you will, is uh, um, talk to us. You know, we want to be able to help you do your research, and if lipidomics is a part of that, that's great. We'd love to be a part of that. We'd love to help you do that work. Uh, just send us an email, give us a call, stop by, and, you know, we'll get the ball rolling, and then hopefully we can get you some good quality data. Thanks. Questions? Hey, Greg, we have a, we have a couple questions here. Uh, first one is, uh, why not include a free fatty acid internal standard? Right. So I think we're going to be doing that, but because we haven't been using that up to now, um, and because it's not a part of that splash mix, it's not uh, mm, prepackaged, shall we say. So there's absolutely every reason 
to be sticking that free fatty acid into the mixture. We just haven't been doing it yet. So I fully expect that there will be uh, that addition made. And in fact, if somebody wants to put into the chat any suggestions for a highly representative or useful fatty acid that we should be looking at including, please do so. Is would a sample rich in free fatty acid limit measurement of other types of lipids that are present? Does a sample rich in free fatty acid limit detection of other types of lipids? So I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the, the sort of first principles kind of answer would be that it's limiting. It could be limiting in two ways. One, you could, uh, well, sort of, one, one would be if it interferes with the extraction at all, and I have no reason to think that that's true. Uh, two would be if it interferes or exceeds chromat uh, chromatographic capacity. That would be a big deal because if we uh, saturate the um, column capacity with the free fatty acids, that could screw up the uh, behavior of the downstream uh, lipids and cause us some problems. And I guess sort of 2A would be if we have to dilute the sample with high abundances of free fatty acids such that they stay on scale, we could be diluting out everything else. Other questions? At this time. All right, thank you. Thanks for attending, everybody. It was uh, weird not to have anybody here, but I'm gonna assume there are people out there, so thanks very much. <laughs>